Hello and good morning everyone and welcome to Baiju's exam prep IAS. So today before we are starting with our Hindu analysis, here is an important announcement that our mega scholarship program, it is still available till 12th June under which you can get up to 60% scholarship in our online and offline classroom programs. So you can click the link in the pinned comment and register yourself so our counsellors can call you back. Now let us take a look at the table of contents, what all topics we will be covering. But before that, another important thing I want to tell you that after the session ends, do not forget to go to our telegram channel where a small quiz prepared on this session will be available for all of you. So here are the topics that we'll be taking a look at today. First is, India looks at devising its own standards to assess socio-economic progress. So this topic is related to social issues. Next, we have a topic related to both science and environment related to GM crops or the transgenic crops, the genetically modified crops. After that, we have yet another very important topic, especially because of the green hydrogen mission. That is that an IIT Madras team, it has generated a system through which sea water can be used for production of hydrogen. Then under the prelims bites, we will be taking up three topics. One is Army Air Defense Widen Swings. Second is Navy Showcases Twin Carrier Operations where we'll be discussing the various aircraft carriers of India. And then what is the Diamond League? Now this topic is related to sports. Now sports questions, they can be asked in your prelims. So here is our first topic. India looks at devising own standards to assess socio-economic progress. Now up until now, what was happening? There were certain international standards for assessing various socio-economic indicators, socio-economic factors like the health of the people in the country, their, their levels of malnutrition, stunting, life expectancy and others. Now what has happened is that over time it has been found that these international standards, they are one size fit all. So that means that they are an average. For every country, the same standard is taken. Be the country be like a West European country like France or Germany, which is highly developed, or a country like Somalia, which is very underdeveloped. So what has India seen is that over time, it has been found that these socio-economic indicators used by the international bodies, they are not akin to the standards of India. So that is why the various reports we get regarding these indicators regarding India, they are not properly, they are not entirely correct. So India wants to discard this approach and it wants to develop its own assessment criteria. Now why is this a news? Because a working paper regarding the same issue, it has been prepared by the Prime Minister's Economic Advisory Council. So what all does it suggest? What all indicators are to be targeted under this working paper? One is childhood stunting. Now up until now, World Health Organization standards are being used to assess childhood stunting. Now what is stunting? Stunting is when a child's height is not according to their age. The child is shorter than the peers, than his or her peers. Then we have female labor force participation rate. First, what is labor force participation rate? It is the section of working population. Working population, it lies between the ages of 15 to 65. More than 14 years, less than 65 years. So the section or the proportion of the working age population which is either involved in any kind of employment or is actively seeking employment. So that is the work, that is the labor force participation rate. Okay. So female labor force participation rate means number of female members of the society between this age group that are either in employment or are seeking employment. Now this data is given by the International Labour Organization. The third data we are talking about given by the United Nations is life expectancy at birth. 
Now this is a very important indicator. Why? Because it makes up one third of the weightage of the Human Development Index that is published by United Nations Development Program. Okay. So these three indicators are to be targeted. We want to develop our own India based standards for these indicators. So what will be changed amongst these indicators and why? First childhood stunting as I have told you it is when a child height, the ch height of the child is not equal to their peers. It is less than the average height of the peers. Now WHO which is giving the standards for childhood stunting. It uses a very small sample size for their study of stunting. Moreover, the benchmarks that it has set or the basic thresholds that it has set, it has for that the samples were taken only from the affluent areas of six countries. Amongst these six countries, India was also there. So only affluent areas, that means amongst the rich people or the upper middle class people. So that means this is not portraying a general picture of India, the general middle class picture of India. Even amongst this benchmark, it was found that Indian children, they were generally smaller compared to the other country children. This may be because of a variety of reasons, especially because of genetics. So this factor has not been undertaken into account. Okay. So according to the deputy director of health and nutrition of save the children, Antarmai Dash, according to him, this skewed benchmarks, it is leading to an increased number of statistical children who are either stunted or wasted. So it is increasing the number of stunted and wasted children in India by a margin of 12 million for stunted and 10 million for wasted children. Even generally amongst the developing countries it has been found out that these standards that are being used by WHO has been inflating the number of stunted and malnourished children. And for that purpose, many countries, they have developed already their own benchmarks. Countries like USA, like Indonesia, like UK, they have all developed their own standards. Next, female labor force participation rate. I've already explained what this is. Now, this particular indicator by the International Labor Organization, it fails to capture the economically productive work that is done by women as a part of their domestic duties. What can all that be? Collection of milk, preparation of milk products, poultry farming and so on. For example, there is a household and they have a cow. So the woman, she has a duty of milking the cow and in return she gets some milk which can be used by the household. Now, if the woman was not involved in milking of the cow, the milk wouldn't have been produced, right? And this family would have had to go to the market to purchase that milk. So that means that the woman, when she is milking the cow, she is doing some productive economic activity, which is not included under the female labor force participation rate. Okay, so the household duties that are being done, they are not accounted for in this particular indicator by the ILO. In fact, this issue was also highlighted under the economic survey of 2022-23. And there was a revision of the female labor force participation rate. Now the periodic labor force survey of India, it gave this to be 32.5% in 2020-21. However, after the revision, it was found out that it is actually what? More than 40%. It is 46.2%. And ILO says, ILO says it is just 24% in India. So there is such a big discrepancy 
almost 22 percent discrepancy when seen uh, when we see the ILO data and the data by India. Third is life expectancy. As stated, it forms one third of the human development index. Right. So according to the United Nations, the life expectancy in India had a sharp decline, a decline by 3.67 years between 2019 and 2021. So in 2019, it was 70.91% and it declined to 67.24% in 2021. Now it was said that it, it is because of the COVID related mortalities. However, the COVID related mortalities that has been considered by the United Nations, they are quite inflated for India. For example, according to the official data, it is 375.8 mortalities per lakh of population. And UN considers it to be very high, while India says it is just like this. India also stated that it is much less compared to countries like Brazil, for which it was 645.4 people per lakh population, USA, for which it was 606.7, and for Italy, for which it was 587.7 per lakh. Okay, so life expectancy that that experienced such a huge dip of almost 3.67 years that was also not properly calcul calculated because UN used much inflated figures compared to the official data. Now, previously also. India has adopted certain changes in various standards, various estimation standards in order to cater to domestic needs and not following like sheep the international standards. For example, in 2023 itself, the health ministry, it released its own estimation regarding the TB, the tuberculosis burden in India. So according to this data of health ministry, the TB burden of India was 196 people per lakh of our population. WHO said it is 210 people per lakh population. Now India said that its data, it is more accurate. Why? Because they have taken data from various sources on the basis of incidence of the disease, individual infection rates, number of people who, wa who went to get any healthcare facility against TB. They took data from two very important portals, that is Nikshay portal, which is a portal to calculate, which is a portal of private sector drug sales. And the other portal from which the information was taken was Subnational Certification System, which gets the data from all the states of the country and determines whether the states they can get TB free certificates or not. So according to this, health ministry said that our data is more accurate, more based on the domestic standards. Next, India also dropped the question on anemia from NFHS 6. Now, NFHS 6, it is, it is an uh, exercise that is, that is to be undertaken. NHF, last we have National Family Health Survey 5. That was the last survey we had. We did not have any census, so that is why the data from NFHS 5 and the upcoming NFHS 6 will be very important. We have dropped the questions on anemia from this study. Why? Because we need very accurate data to target the disease of anemia in India. Now anemia, according to NFHS 5, which uses the WHO standards, according to that, the anemia incidence in India is 57% of women between the ages of 15 to 49, they have anemia. And amongst the children between the ages of 6 months to 59 months, 67% children of India, they have anemia. 
However, it has been stated that the cutoffs of hemoglobin level that is used by WHO to determine whether a person has anemia or not, they may not be suited for India. For India, the standards might be very different. Why? Because the cutoff that is decided whether to determine whether or not a person has anemia, it depends on age, gender, physiological status, altitude and many other factors. So WHO which is taking a generalized picture of the entire thing, its data is not suitable for India. So there is a danger, a big danger of over diagnosis of the number of such cases. Now what will be the impact of all this? Why are we trying so hard to go away from this one size fits all technique? See, the environmental, social and governance indicators, they are very important, especially for these two reasons. Nowadays, many companies, many international organizations, they take their decisions with regards to investment and trade on the basis of this data. So if this data is highly inflated in the negative territory, then it becomes very negative for our economic for your economic needs. So this, these indicators, they are very important for our economy as well. Economic, social and governance indicators, not environmental, I'm so sorry. Also, this leads to a creation of a negative narrative regarding any problem in the country. That no matter how many steps we are taking, we are not able to eliminate that problem in our country. So that leads to what? That leads to a negative feedback which can adversely impact our policy making. See policy making it is highly based on what? Evidences. And these indicators are the evidences on the basis of which policies need to be made. So if we get this negative fee feedback again and again without any problem of ours because it is the indicators standards that are not akin to India. So because of that, we are continuously getting a negative feedback and that affects adversely our policy making and any policy implementation efforts. However, there are certain concerns that India should aspire for best, best standards instead of lowering the benchmarks. So many of the people who were interviewed by the Hindu, they said that instead of lowering the benchmarks, why do we not want to go to the higher benchmarks for the country? Why not make such progress that these benchmarks, which are not akin to the benchmarks of India, eventually become the benchmarks of India as well. So instead of looking at a glass half empty approach, we need to look at a glass half full approach with regards to all these indicators and all these standards that are given by the international agencies. So with that, we end our first topic. Okay. Now we come to our second topic which is about the transgenic or the genetically modified crops. So a new transgenic cotton for which we need field trials. So this cotton, it is, it contains a gene known as Cry2AI. And this makes the cotton crop resistant to pink ballworm, which is a big pest that can attack and destroy the cotton crops. Now we have taken this question because the genetically engineered appraisal committee, it has asked four states of India. What are the four states? Maharashtra, Gujarat, Haryana, and Telangana. It has asked these four states to conduct field trials of, of this new GM cotton which has the cry to AI genes and it will help in preventing any attacks of the pink ballworms. Now when the GEAC it requested this to the states, two of the states Telangana and Gujarat they have refused to undertake the trials. Okay. 
Now, what is the process of approval of GM crops in India? See, these states, they have not agreed to take up the trials because of certain reasons which have not been disclosed to the GEAC. However, the field trials, they are a very important part for any kind of approval to be given to the GM crops. So what is the whole process through which the GM crop has to go in order to get an approval from the GEAC and eventually the Ministry of Agriculture and finally to be introduced as a commercially available and cultivable crop. First, there is the RCGM, Review Committee on Genetic Manipulation on genetic manipulation. Now RCGM, it assesses and decides on the applications regarding the testing of GM crops in the country. So the companies, they need to provide an explanation regarding their new variety and they have to submit this application with the RCGM. Now RCGM, it is a specialized body of the Department of Biotechnology. Okay, so what happens here is RCGM receives the application and it assesses the application regarding the testing of this crop. Now RCGM, it is responsible or it regulates biosafety research level 1 trials. So there are two, two type of trials that are undertaken before a crop can go to the field. Biosafety Research Trials Level 1, Biosafety Research Trials Level 2. Now Level 1 is regulated by RCGM and for Level 1 what happens is that the land of no more than one acre, it needs to be taken at a single location over which the crops will be grown and tested. Overall, there can be approximately 20 locations that can be undertaken for biosafety trial 1. Then after it is approved by RCGM, this application then goes to GEAC, Genetic Engineering Appraisal Committee. It then assesses the applications for field trials. Okay. Now, B, now biosafety research trial level 2. It is under the regulation of GEAC. So GEAC assesses the crops on the basis of this trial, level 2 of this trial. The level 2 trial, it can take place in an area less than equal to 2.5 acre. And the number of places where it can take place depends from plant to plant. So the, that decision is taken on case by case basis. Now, if it is approved from here, then field trial assessment, final assessment is done to decide if the crop can be commercialized. Now, please note that the Ministry of Environment, it can give its approval for any crop only after three trials of the crop have taken place. In the first trial, what happens? In the, it is the first season in which the crops are sown first crop season and the basic parameters that need to be used in first in this first trial are are equivalent to biosafety research trial level 1 then we have the second in the second season where either level 1 or level 2 standards can be adopted then we have a third trial where level 2 standards have to be adopted and that this is to be done in the third season. For example, cotton is a kharif crop, okay? So, first, first trial will take place this year in the kharif season on the basis of the standards given in biosafety research trial level 1. Then next year, in the next, next season, the second trial will take place on the basis of either level 1 or level 2. Then in the third season, the third trial will take place on the basis of level 2, okay. So only after these three trials, they have taken place, only after that can the environmental clearance can be given or the environmental release can be given for this particular crop. There is 
a monitoring and evaluation committee which monitors these small scale trials on the behalf of GEAC and continuously reports about these trials to the body. If everything is well and good, all the trials are going well, there are no problems that are pointed out by anyone, then the crops they are cleared by GEC for commercial or environmental release. Okay, Then the application goes to Ministry of Agriculture. Ministry of Agriculture, after checking the Seed Act of India, it allows for this seed to be finally released into the market and be available for the farmers for their use. So what has been the history of GM crops in India? So as of now, the first and the only GM crop that is in commercial use in India is the BT cotton. It was introduced in the year 2002, developed by a company known as Monsanto. Now, as of now, this particular variety of cotton, BT cotton, it covers 96% of the total cotton farming area of India. So, that is very significant. It protected the cotton plants from the attack of the ball worms. Then 2002, this was released. In 2006, because of a variety of environmental and economic concerns related to Terminator technology and other things, many activists, they approached the Supreme Court against the introduction of GM crops in the country. In 2010, our Environment Minister, Sri Jairam Ramesh, he, he blocked the release of the first edible GM crop in India, that is BT Brinjal. Between 2012 and 2013, what happened is that there was a parliamentary panel that was developed or formed on the GM crops, on the issue of these crops. So this parliamentary, parliamentary panel, it said that it suggested a moratorium on any kind of GM trials in the country, which was again supported by a 2013 Supreme Court suggestion. Please note, it is not any decision by a Supreme Court. It is just a suggestion given to the, given to the government. So, Supreme Court also suggested that there should be a moratorium on GM trials in India unless proper regulatory mechanisms they can be set up for the safety of the environment as well as the farmers. Then in 2014, what happened is that the then environment minister allowed for these trials. And in March 2014, the GEAC, it approved the field trials for 11 genetically modified crops in the country. Later on, more approvals, they were provided for field trials. However, have any of these been introduced? No, not yet. In 2016, a green signal was given for the field trials of the GM mustard. Now, GM mustard, it was the indigenously produced variety of a GM crop produced in Delhi University. However, Supreme Court, it stayed this order. Eventually, however, this was further pursued and finally on 18th October, 2022 GM mustard it got the approval from the GEAC for the for its environmental or commercial release in February 2023 the government of India gave the final signature on this decision of the GEAC so it is not like it will be suddenly introduced in the markets it will take approximately two through three years for GM mustard to get properly integrated into our markets. So this is the story of genetically modified crops in India. We studied what has been the whole timeline. We also studied what is the regulatory infrastructure, what all trials are being undertaken in order for a GM crop to get an approval for commercial release. Now the third topic, now this topic is very important for us, why? Because the government has released what? Green Hydrogen Mission. We want to 
become big producers of hydrogen gas because hydrogen it is a very efficient fuel it is the fuel of the future now under this what has happened is that some researchers of iit madras they have developed certain critical components which are simpler easier to use and cheaper compared to the current technology for highly efficient cost effective way to electrolyze sea water to generate hydrogen so up until now up until now what has happened the current technology for hydrogen production it is highly energy intensive a lot of power is required for electrolysis to take place it requires expensive oxide polymer separator zirconium oxide so it requires these expensive zirconium oxide separators to be used between the cathode and the anode and it uses fresh water for electrolysis it cannot use the marine or the sea water so that is why this particular research by the students of iit madras by the researchers of iit madras becomes very important for us because this technology it uses alkaline water or the sea water in place of fresh water so the fresh water it can be used for other purposes the water can directly be taken from the arabian sea bay of bengal any part of sea it can be taken from there and hydrogen can be produced so that that is very important for what our water security as well water it will not get diverted for the production of hydrogen also carbon based materials they are being used as electrodes instead of use of metals so what happens what's the problem with using metals the metals they get easily corroded by the various salts in the sea water when we are using these carbon based materials this problem of corrosion it gets eliminated moreover various catalysts are being used to enhance the production of both hydrogen as well as oxygen see what happens in electrolysis is that water it is split into its constituents that is hydrogen and oxygen right so metal these metal based catalyst what does a catalyst do catalyst affects the speed of any reaction it can either increase the speed or decrease the speed usually people associate catalyst only with increase in the speed of chemical reactions but that's not true however in this case these catalyst they enhance or increase the production of both the gases hydrogen and oxygen even when at the at the way, at the electrodes there is deposition of any impurities or chemical deposition because of the use of the sea water see electrodes are not getting corroded however there can be certain depositions that can take place around the electrodes so despite those kind of depo depositions of any impurities or chemicals despite that these catalysts ensure that there is enough production of hydrogen and oxygen moreover an economical cellulose based separator is used see zirconium oxide based separators they were very expensive these cellulose cellulose based separators they are comparatively cheaper so that reduces the overall cost of this system moreover the most important part is that this entire setup it is optimized in such a way that it can be directly connected with solar photovoltaic cells so what was happening in case of green hydrogen we were using renewable energy to to conduct the process of electrolysis and produce hydrogen right so this is a very big shot in the arm for a green hydrogen energy production also all these cells they have a high lifetime of more than 6 months now generally 
let us take a look at hydrogen as a fuel is it important why is it necessary see hydrogen it is the most abundant element in the universe 75 percent of the universe of the known universe of the one we can see it is made up of hydrogen now hydrogen it provides a very clean alternative to the use of methane for example what happens for any product to act as a fuel there is a need for what oxidation in order to release energy so what happens in case of hydrogen when hydrogen is oxide is oxidized it produces a very clean output that is high that is water contrary to that when we oxidize methane there is production of carbon dioxide large amount of carbon dioxide so that makes makes hydrogen a very clean alternative to the use of natural gas or methane also it has the highest calorific value that is 150 kilojoules per gram of hydrogen it is very efficient in nature it does not leave any residue the end product is very clean it is water it has zero or near zero emissions associated with it so that is why hydrogen has become a very attractive fuel for the global community now globally hydrogen has already been used in many countries in many ways for example china it has the highest number of hydrogen vehicles and the highest number of hydrogen fueling stations for cars so just like you go to the cng stations to get cng filled in your cars that run on cng similarly china has such stations for hydrogen cars the second number of high, highest number of stations are in japan then we have south korea germany and us in fact a company called alstom it has produced a train cordia island which is the first completely hydrogen powered train in the world so it was introduced in 2018 in germany so this train it entirely runs on hydrogen as a fuel in 2020 in fact in india also india's first indigenous hydrogen fuel cell bus a bus based on hydrogen it was unveiled it was done in pune and it was developed by an institute of the csir that is kpit kirtane pandit information technologies in pune so we have also developed a bus that can run entirely on oxygen now when we talk about oxygen you must know about green sorry hydrogen so when we talk about hydrogen you must know about green hydrogen however there is an entire spectrum that is associated with the hydrogen we'll take a look at that as well in this section so what are the various types of hydrogen or what do you understand by hydrogen spectrum first is green hydrogen which is produced through electrolysis using the energy from renewable sources right then we have something called blue hydrogen or the low carbon hydrogen now over here what happens is that this hydrogen this hydrogen is produced mainly from natural gas that is methane and the process that is used is known as steam reforming so very hot water it is mixed with methane in order to produce hydrogen however this also produces a lot of carbon dioxide so carbon dioxide becomes a very important byproduct of this system however why is it low carbon hydrogen because this carbon that is generated it is completely captured and stored so it is completely captured and stored so that this carbon dioxide it does not get released in the environment and increase the concentration of our greenhouse gases so this is blue hydrogen associated to that is the gray hydrogen the same process takes place we undertake 
steam reforming over natural gas in this as well. However, there is no provision of carbon capture and storage that was available in the blue hydrogen process. Okay, so these are the three. Next, we have black and brown hydrogen. Black is associated with coal, right? So, black hydrogen is generated by using coal and brown is associated with what? Lignite. So, black Black hydrogen is produced using coal, brown hydrogen is produced using lignite by a process known as gasification. Now please note that the brown and the black hydrogen it is completely opposite of green hydrogen. It is the dirtiest type of hydrogen, it is the most environmentally damaging in nature. Next we have pink hydrogen. Now these are a few colors which are quite new. These terminologies are quite new. So please take care of it. Next we have pink hydrogen. Now in this type of hydrogen, electrolysis is done using nuclear power. In some places it is also known as red hydrogen or purple hydrogen. Then we have turquoise hydrogen. This technology for producing hydrogen, it is quite new and there have not been any large scale plants for this production. So what does it use? What is the technology being used here? It uses a process known as methane pyrolysis in order to produce hydrogen gas and solid carbon. There is no production of carbon dioxide in this process because there is no oxidation that is taking place in this process. The pure contents of natural gas, that is carbon and hydrogen, they are completely separated from each other. In electrolysis, what we were doing? We were separating the contents of water. Here we are completely separating the contents of methane in the form of a gas, that is hydrogen, and solid carbon. Okay, so this is turquoise hydrogen. This is a very new technology. Then we have yellow hydrogen, which is a subgroup of green hydrogen only. Yellow, why? Because of sun. So any hydrogen which is produced by the use of solar energy is yellow hydrogen. So it is a subgroup of green hydrogen only. Next we have white hydrogen. Now white hydrogen is something that is naturally occurring. We are not producing it. It is naturally occurring. Geological within the earth. Geological hydrogen which is found in various underground deposits. And it can be brought onto the ground. It can be used by the humans by the process of fracking. Now we use fracking as a process for shale oil and gas. Same way this naturally occurring hydrogen can also be brought onto the ground and it can be used by us. However, as of now, there are no particular strategies for exploiting this hydrogen because the other means of produce, production of hydrogen, they are comparatively cheaper, more cost effective and more efficient in nature. Okay. So with that, we come to an end to the first three topics related to your mains. Next, we have the prelim bite section. Under here, the first one is enhancing air defense in India especially army air defense. Now up until now what was happening, we were completely focused upon our western wing, upon our western border, our border with Pakistan. However, with the increase in the threat of China, we have now started to give our focus towards our northern border as well. Right? So northern border what is the challenge associated with it? It is the terrain, the altitude. So there are a lot of challenges associated with our northern border, which are not associated with our western border. So that is why the army is trying to procure more components, more defense strategies, more arms and ammunitions that are light in weight. And that can be easily transported to our northern border as well. So we need to focus on a northern border due to the Chinese aggression and because of this, these are the various 
strategies or the various things we are using for the same. First is project Akash Teer, that is sky arrow. Literally, if we translate it into English. So, it is a rupees 2000 crore project. And this will do what? It will link the various radars of the army and the various control centers of the army air defense. So, everything will be linked. So, this will prevent any kind of overlap or duplication of efforts. For example, there is a radar here, here and here. So, this radar, it is covering this area, this radar, this area, this, this area. So, there is duplication or overlap of the area. Akash Teer will help us in optimizing this problem. So, that one radar can focus in one particular location, other radar in other particular location. So, it will also enable the communication of the Army's air defense with the Indian Air Force. So, Indian Air Force integration with Army Air Defense, it will be quite effective after Akash Teer comes into being. There is also a focus on the man portable air defense system. Now, it was seen that during the Russian Ukraine war, M pads or man portable air defense systems they became very important right so we are focusing on them as well we are focusing on them because they are highly effective when in when they have night vision enabled so during day during night the people that are carrying those defense systems they can undertake any kind of defense activities we are also trying to reduce the weights of the radars now in the northern, northern boundary region, because the altitudes are quite high, we want to reduce the weight of our of all the components, right? So we are trying to reduce the weights of the radars that are being used by using gallium nitride based modules within the radar. So this will help in reducing the weight of these radars and this will help in increasing our capacity to establish radars at such high altitudes as well. Moreover, the Akash surface to air missile, it is also being tailored now for mountain regions. It is also being made what? Light weighted. So, so please note that this missile, it is being constructed by the Bharat Dynamics Limited and we have already signed a contract with them. The government has already signed a contract worth 8,160 crores for new advanced Akash surface to air missiles for our army air defense system. So these are all the steps we are undertaking to protect our northern borders as well from any kind of aggression. Next we have the various aircraft carrier of India. Now what will happen is that by the end of this year, a new aircraft carrier, INS Vikrant, it will be introduced in the Navy. So now we'll have two aircraft carriers with us by the end of this year. Right now we have only one active aircraft carrier. So what are the various aircraft carriers we have had since our independence? First was INS Vikrant, same name, okay. It was the same name as the one that will be inducted at the end of this year. So INS Vikrant, it was first launched in 1945 as Hercules. It was not a part of Indian Navy as such. Then it was purchased from the British in the year 1957. And finally, it was commissioned into the Indian Navy in the year 1961. Now, 1961 is an important year. Why? Because in December 1961, we had liberation of Goa. And this particular aircraft carrier was very useful in that operation. We also had the Indo-Pak War of 1971, the Bangladesh Liberation War, where again this particular aircraft carrier played a very important role. This was the first ever carrier for an first ever airport carrier 
for any Asian country. So that was a big achievement. India was the only country that had an aircraft carrier. Finally, after working for many years, more than 30 years, it was decommissioned in the year 1997. Then the next one was INS Virat. It was commissioned in 1959 in the British Navy. Okay, it was not in India up till now. In 1959, it first came into being in the British no Royal Navy as HMS Herms or Hermes. Okay, so in the year 1986, we finally acquired this particular aircraft carrier and it was inducted in the Indian Navy in 1987. Now this aircraft carrier also took part in some very important operations. First was Operation Jupiter in 1989 which was related to peacekeeping in the, in the country of Sri Lanka. Then Operation Parakram which took place after the 2001 parliament attacks on India. Then Operation Vijay which took place during 1999 Kargil War. It was finally decommissioned in March 2017. Then we had INS Vikramaditya. Now INS Vikramaditya, it originally belonged to Russia and its earlier name was Admiral Gorshkov. Okay, it was a Russian aircraft carrier which was bought by India, refurbished and it was finally inducted in 2013. Now, it is Indian Navy's biggest ship, even, even bigger than the INS Vikran that will be inducted at the end of this year. Then we have finally the INS Vikrant. The biggest achievement with INS Vikrant is that it is a fully indigenously built aircraft carrier of India. It was built by Cochin Shipyard Limited. And it is expected that after the trials that are going on, it will be finally operational and inducted into the Indian Navy by the year 2023. Okay. Now the last topic that is about Diamond League. Now this is related to sports. Now Diamond League is an annual track and field events. Track and field events like Long jump, high jump, short put, discus throw, javelin throw, running and so on. Okay. So there are a total 32 events that are associated with the Diamond League. The Diamond League, it came into being in the year 2010. It started in 2010 and it aimed to replace the IAAFs. What is IAAF? International Association of Athletics Federations which was earlier known as World Athletic. So it aimed to replace the IAAF's Golden League. Now Golden League it was mainly focused just upon Europe specific athletic competitions. So we wanted to expand that, that purview. So Diamond League was finally introduced in 2010. Current host of the Diamond League is Paris and why is this important for us? Because in this Diamond League, our long jump candidate M. Sri Shankar, he has received a bronze medal. He is only the third Indian to get any kind of medal in the Diamond League. Before him were Vikas Gauda who got this medal in discus throw. And we had Neera Chopra who got it in javelin throw. So with that we come to an end to today's Hindu news analysis. However, please note that I request all of you to attempt these mains type questions because now you have to focus on your mains preparation after giving the prelims. So what are these questions? The one size fits all approach to measuring socio-economic indicators at national level can affect developing nations adversely. Do you agree? So it is an opinion based questions. You give your opinion and you give facts to support your opinion. Illustrate how India has addressed this issue. Adequate examples have been provided for this as well. The second question is India's policy on GM crops has not been constant. 
discuss you can say that how we initially introduced the crops then there was a moratorium then again introduction then 2016 again there was a ban then finally in 2022 23 there was an approval for gm mustard so as of now we have only one gm crop that is available for commercial cultivation after a few years we will be having another one also throw some light on the gm crop testing mechanism in the country you can tell about the various bio safety trials level 1 and level 2 also please do not forget first to answer these questions and also do not forget to head to our telegram channel to to attempt a quiz that has been based on this particular session okay so thank you very much if you like the video do not forget to share it and drop your comments we'll be very happy to read about it thank you very much and have a very good day ahead